everyone. It's 11 o'clock, so we're ready to get started. Thank, every, thank you, everyone, for joining us today for our webinar. My name is Jackie Carville, and I'll be coordinating the webinar today. I'm here with Matt Kaiser, who will be going over several of our next-gen sequencing workflows to give you an overview of the capabilities of our Laser Gene Genomic Suite. You may have noticed that your phone has been muted. However, we do encourage you to ask questions along the way. To ask a question, just type it into the chat dialog and select Send to Host. I will then direct these questions to Matt to be answered for the whole group. If you need any assistance or have any questions during the webinar, you can send a chat message to me, email me at webinars at dnastar.com, or tweet us at the Twitter handle at dnastarinc. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Matt. Thank you, Jackie, and thanks again for joining us uh, this afternoon or morning or evening, wherever you're uh, um, joining us from. I'm going to share my desktop here, so just give me a moment. And we'll bring up a PowerPoint slide. Okay, so today we'll we'll do a, a general overview of the DNA Star Laser Gene Suite, and in particular the Genomic Suite. Um, and I'd like to uh, introduce um, four different workflows. And so we'll start with some slides uh, to introduce those workflows, and then I'll go into uh, the setup, the assembly of the data, and some of the downstream analysis. So. Hopefully, I won't be going back and forth too much. Um, if there are questions, uh, please uh, feel free to chat them in. And I'll try to reiterate as I move from workflow to workflow um, uh, and respecify the workflow that, that, we're, that we're talking about. So, so hopefully, we'll be able to pull this off and, and cover a lot of material here in the next hour or so. So DNA Star, uh, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, is located in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, you can see the nice picture here of Lake Monona in the state capital of Wisconsin, and, and we're uh, just a little bit up the road from the downtown of Madison. Um, our sales team, our developers uh, are located in Madison largely, um, and what that means is that we can uh, communicate directly with uh, the folks that write the software. So my role at the company oftentimes is to listen to customer feedback um, and bring that to a development team, and we, we, we do that to improve our software. And with every uh, release, we have new features. And today, we'll look at some of those new features. Um, and we'll have some new features coming out here in the, in the next uh, few weeks. So um, one thing that's uh, we, we're celebrating this, this year is our 30th anniversary. So DNA Star, uh, of course, has been in the business for a long time. We've produced uh, software since 1984. You can see in the picture here, we have our founder, Dr. Fred Blattner was a genomics pioneer, and uh, his lab, Fred and his lab, were the first to sequence an E. coli genome uh, back in the 1990s. And some of the other folks here in the picture from 1984, um, are uh, some of these folks are still with the company, uh, still writing code and, and developing great software. So we have a long-standing uh, history in developing software and supporting our customers uh, in this field. And that results in our software being cited in peer-reviewed publications um, more than twice as, as frequently as our nearest competitor. So we can trace this back to 1985. Um, so you can see a long history of producing research-grade software. And so with our, our next-gen tools, uh, we really strive to develop software that um, can support all different types of projects as well as um, all the different sequencing platforms. And that's really a key distinction with, with our software versus other competitors or open source software, is that the software is flexible enough to allow um, um, de novo assembly or reference guided assembly or you know, metagenomic workflows um, and can accommodate the different platforms so that with one software package, you have a solution then for all different types of sequence data as well as all different types of, of workflows. So one of the first questions that we'll get in, uh, from customers that are thinking about a commercial um, software or a desktop-based software is, does it perform well enough um, so that I can handle or, or assemble and analyze the largest of my data sets? And is it comparable to uh, you know, open source software running on a big Linux cluster? And so one of the first things I like to show is a, a, a list of benchmarks that shows that our software has very, very fast assembly times. And so, for example, a human genome data set, which has uh, over a billion reads, nearly 40x coverage, to do the assembly and the SNP analysis and to produce the output files takes about 13 hours. 
and that's an extremely fast time for human genome data sets. Um, some of the open source competitors, by comparison, we will run those to do some comparisons uh, between our software, um, can take just that long to do the mapping, and then you have to feed all the data back through the SNP caller, chromosome by chromosome, and it can take hours per chromosome. So the amount of time saved with our software is, is really uh, impressive over, over many of the competitors. Smaller data sets like human exomes and things like cancer panels uh, can be measured. It might be an hour or two for an exome. And for smaller data sets like panels and, and microbial genomes, it's measured in minutes. So assembly speed is, is excellent. Um, accuracy then is also uh, important for a number of the different workflows. So we have some metrics on, on how accurate the assemblies are. Uh, more recently, we developed uh, some methods to validate um, the process for SNP analysis, and we've determined our accuracy is now greater than 99%. And I'll talk about this in, in more detail, how we, how we uh, measure accuracy. And we also provide tools for the customer, and these are new in version 12 earlier this year, so it allows a customer to provide a validation data set. And a validated data set is, is just a, a set of data and known SNP variations, and you s sequence that data set and run it through our assembler and SNP caller, and then you can get an accuracy measurement on your, on your data set. And so, um, so right now our accuracy is you know, over 99%. We're working to improve that um, further still, so there's still 0.2% that, that we're, we're not detecting. And we're working on, and that's for a variety of reasons. It might be assembly issues. It could be data issues. It could be um, issues with the reference set that's used. That's, the, that's not 100% accurate. So we um, are, are striving to achieve 100% accuracy um, with, with our SNP calling. There's also accuracy measurements for um, other types of assemblies. So our de novo assemblies, um, th those are a little more difficult to um, assess the accuracy. So, so for instance, if we have a microbial genome, um, the way that we measure accuracy is that we will uh, de novo assemble a, a, a genome that's already been sequenced and, and, and we have a reference genome for comparison. And so one of the data sets that we'll look at today is an E. coli data set um, from a K12, and uh, we've de novo assembled that with some, uh, we have both ion torrent and Illumina uh, mate pair data and we align the contigs and create scaffolds. And the scaffold is uh, contigs in, in a genomic order um, that if it's in the correct order and you align it to the genome, uh, you should get a mauve alignment like this that has one big block. And you can see contig group, which is our scaffold, and we have in this, and then the reference genome, the 913 reference genome. And we can see there's two blocks there. Well, actually, one of them is the origin of replication. So we have, have a scaffold then in a mob alignment that is, you know, the entire genome. So it's a really nice way to measure, you know, do I have accurate contigs? Can I scaffold them accurately? And again, SeekMan software is very good at de novo assembly and, and scaffolding. We also have uh, a couple of, on our website, um, and I have a little screenshot here of SeekMan engine rated number one for assembling Illumina 454 data, uh, and this is de novo transcriptome data. So transcriptomes have a whole different set of challenges. We're not going to talk about de novo transcriptome too much today, but um, and de novo transcriptomes can be even more challenging. They can be have uh, um, housekeeping genes or contaminants present. So our software provides all different means for normalizing the data and then getting a really nice de novo transcriptome. So there's a couple papers on our website where, where so two different groups assessed our software and came out with very nice results. So great accuracy for SNP calling, um, accurate and stringent de novo assemblies um, makes uh, DNA star really a nice option for, for next-gen sequence analysis. So when it comes to um, running these assemblies, We've really designed the algorithms to um, be optimized for some of the newer computers that, that, that we have for desktop computing. And the new processors, the i7 processors, for instance, um, are very, very compatible with our, our templated assembler. They work very well together and, and give us great assembly times. Um, but in general, though, um, just the basic uh, uh, computer that you have, maybe with a little extra disk space. So if you're doing alignments to a human genome, uh, a lot of that data is, is processed on disk, written down to disk. So you need uh, some scratch disk space, we'll call it. So the ideal setup, you know, it could be a laptop or just a desktop computer with a C drive that has 16 gigs of RAM and some, a few cores. 
a scratch disk that you can plug in with USB 3. That processes the temporary files. Um, and you, you might only need those two uh, drives. If you've got large data sets, it, it's also helpful to have a storage drive. Um, at DNA Star, I use our network drive. So I have my raw data up on the network, and that works fine. Um, I usually save the data out locally to a local drive. And so if, you, if you're looking to um, set up uh, DNA star software or run demos, um, you know, keep in mind that with larger data sets, you, you'll want to have enough scratch disk space um, available to you. Now, there will be some, some other options here very, very shortly, and you'll see that our next webinar in this, in this series is actually uh, about our cloud software. So this is our, our ground software. We're also going to introduce um, a new uh, uh, assembly on the cloud that would allow you to use hardware that's up on the cloud. So you can set up assemblies locally and use hardware there. So if you are uh, limited in your hardware, that may be an option for you here in, in the next few weeks. So another thing I like to point out with DNA Star software, you know, in addition to uh, the assembly accuracy and speed, um, and the hardware is the support that's provided with our software. And this is really a big distinction between commercial software that's supported well like DNA Star versus just open source software. Uh, we do webinars uh, like this once a month where we cover different topics. We also offer um, over 100 demo videos that are just a few minutes long on all different topics. And of course our software does uh, next-gen workflows it also does things like cloning or primer design. So we have the basic bioinformatics uh, toolkits as well as uh, next-gen workflows on all different topics. So if you're new to the software or if you're starting a new workflow that you haven't done before, be sure to check out our list of demo videos. Um, and, and those are a great starting point to learn capabilities in our software. And of course, monthly webinars. Uh, here we have today's webinar. And I think next month we have the cloud webinar. And so keep an eye out for uh, these particular webinars. I also do webinars uh, individually with customers on a frequent basis. So if, if there's something that we don't cover in a video or in one of these monthly web webinars, um, customers send me sometimes their data sets, and we do a webinar. We assemble the data, look at it, you know, do any kind of troubleshooting and, and, and training you know, that way. So again, webinars are a great tool. So the software that we're going to talk about today is the LaserGene Genomics Suite. Uh, the Genomics Suite is primarily three pieces of software. It's going to be the SeqMan Engine Assembly software. So that will be the starting point. Um, and then from there, we create a, either a SeqMan file or a BAM file. And the downstream analysis tools are either in SeqMan Pro or under Raystar. And so it's those three softwares that we'll uh, be looking at today. There are other components to DNA Star that we're not going to discuss today. That um, you know that are on, on for different types of workflows. It can be things like uh, evolutionary comparisons or phylogenetic comparisons, um, structural biology. So there are other packages at DNA Star as well. So you know if you're interested in protein analysis, you know you can check out our webinar series for protein analysis and, and videos as well. So the the so here's a list of a number of the uh, next-gen assembly and analysis workflows. And you can see that uh, we support um, virtually all the next-gen workflows. Uh, the ones that I have highlighted in red are the, the workflows that we're going to cover today. And de novo genome, uh, which will be a bacterial genome, and then we'll have a metagenomic uh, alignment uh, of uh, bacterial um, sequence, sequences to, uh, it's, a, it's a mix of sequences from um, um, human gut to bacterial databases. And then we'll look at some gene panel, um, a gene panel data set, and then finish up with an RNA-seq data set. And so with those four workflows, you'll get a very good idea of what the capabilities are in our software and what the interface looks like. Um, there are some other workflows here, de novo transcriptome and automated genome closure and genome resequencing and short RNAs. Um, you know, those are, if you're interested in those topics, uh, we have webinars recorded on each one of those topics. So you can go back in our archives and watch webinars on, you know, whole hour-long webinars just on, on one topic. So um, again, this is going to be a little bit more of an overview. So we're going to start with uh, de novo genome. And de novo genome is, uh, um, has some aspects to it that if you're not familiar with, with de novo assemblies, um, I, I could define them a little bit before we look at, at the software. 
Um, the first the first thing that we'll talk about are, are uh, clusters of sequences that have been assembled, and we call those contigs. And so when we do a de novo assembly, the assembler is going through the data, and it looks for matches, and it clusters sequences together. Um, and these, these contigs then have a consensus then. So as the sequences go together, they match a, a growing consensus, and we can set different stringencies to make it more or less uh, tolerant of mismatch within the contig. And so many assemblers will give you a list of contigs. Um, if your goal is to um, complete a genome, um, just having a list of contigs uh, isn't quite enough. So imagine that you, you assemble, and you know, the, even the best de novo assemblies for microbial genomes you know, yields maybe 50 contigs or 75 contigs. Um, those contigs can be in any order. They are, they are um, not connected to each other because there's some unknown element uh, between the contigs that prevents the genome from assembling just in the one big contig. And it's pretty rare that we get a genome that assembles in the one big contig. Uh, viral genomes might do that, or larger genomes that have very few repetitive elements may assemble into one. Uh, but typically you have a number of contigs, and uh, you need then to, uh, to resolve the genome, find a way to get the contigs in the right order. And once they're in the right order, then Resolving the gaps is in, 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 in the unfinished areas becomes a lot easier. And these contigs placed in an order is called uh, are called scaffolds. And once we have our scaffolds built, um, and hopefully it's all automatic. If you have the right data, and I'll show you what that means by having the right data, that's all automated. So we can get contigs, get scaffolds, do some additional auto closure. And what we're left with is a scaffolded genome with hopefully as few of gaps as, as is possible. And so that's kind of what our goal is with, with de novo genome. And um, so there's a couple of uh, things that we should uh, address with um, de novo gen uh, genome assembly. And one of them is why is scaffolding so important? And this, is, this can be confusing because different uh, assemblers or different groups kind of use the terms contigs and scaffolds sometimes interchangeably. And sometimes scaffolds, uh, it's not clear that it's actually an unresolved genome. There are either N's or X's in the gap, so it's not a completed genome. And scaffolding is uh, getting the contigs in the right order um, is really necessary so that you can resolve a particular gap. And doing it manually is very difficult. You know, if you, if you have contigs and you don't know what order they're in, start blasting all of them and trying to figure them out with a big map. And that can take days or weeks to order contigs into a scaffold. So how do we create the scaffolds in software? Well, one of the, re one of the ways is to use mate pair data or paired data. And mate pair data allows um, the forward and reverse reads from mate pair to span across the gaps and it allows you to put an order on contigs. Now, if the mate pair data isn't uh, if it's just pair data and there isn't a great distance between the mate pairs, scaffolding can be limited. So just to give you an idea, if I have paired data where my, my green and red, which is, represents my forward and reverse, um, here I'll get a highlighter here. So we can see we have green reads here, red reads here, and their distance is a couple hundred base pairs, which is common with say Illumina paired end data. Um, if we have a very short paired distance, or if we only have fragment data, which is just single end data, what happens in our de novo assembly is we'll get contig one and two in a repeat region, like an IS element. And we can't get across that with our frag data. It's not long enough. And so what happens is we end up with two contigs that we can't, um, we can't merge them together and we can't order them either. because so we don't know, we have no way of determining that contig one is next to two. So the pair data is too close together. So these red reads, aren't far enough from the, from the green reads to, uh, to, to auto scaffold and determine the order. So this is kind of the situation if you don't have mate pair data or long read data, is you get de novo, de novo contigs and you can't uh, get them in the correct order. So if we have mate pair data or long reads, so if we have some packed bio or you know, we're starting to see some nanopore data, um, um, we can use long reads or mate pair data to build scaffolds. And you can see that we have contig one and two. In this case, we have some mate pair data that's a, a few KB apart. We can anchor reads on one contig, and then the 
mate pairs are on another contig adjacent. And then we can, our algorithms and our software can easily put these contigs in a scaffold. It can just use the mate pair, still leaves us with the gap in the middle, um, but once we get the correct order, then we can focus on the gaps and close the gaps. So that's, again, critical for de novo genome assembly. Um, and of course, there's different mate pair technologies and long read technologies. Our software is designed to be compatible with them and give you an interface, and we'll look at the interface here in, in a bit, and give you an interface then to, I'll just jump out of the PowerPoint, to work with the data. Um, I don't need those annotations, so we'll move out of the PowerPoint now. So I'm going to open um, our Seekman Engine software. And so Seekman Engine is a, uh, it's a, it's a um, we call it a wizard, and it's a guide that helps you set up different assembly types um, and different workflows. And so we've hopefully designed it to be easy enough to use that the first time you look at it, you can just set up your assembly and have success. And we find that most customers are able to do that for most of the workflows. Um, and you just follow the steps and click Next. So we're going to create a new project here, and I just click Next. And I can choose the project type. And you can see at this point, we have all different workflows. And here's some new ones here that I didn't uh, show in the, in the PowerPoint. We have you know, Genome Assembly and Exome. And we have two different gene panel workflows, a Mendelian and a Cancer Gene Panel Assembly, Transcriptome and ChIP-seq and miRNA and Metagenomic and Viral Host Integration. So as we start to pick our workflow, um, we get different screens now. So with, with Genome Assembly, I have several different options. I have templated and templated with control and some special workflows with gap closure. In this case, we're just doing a de novo assembly. So as I make these decisions then uh, and start to determine uh, what the project type is and platform, there's different optimal parameters that will be set up using the Seekman engine algorithms to give you the best possible assembly. And that's really what's key with this user interface is that uh, many of the, the open source programs that people use for next-gen data are, are command line driven, and they can be very difficult to use, and you have to be an expert for each type of workflow that you're trying to do. You may have to be an expert in each workflow and several different types of assemblers. Seekman Engine will um, interpret the input that the user gives here and give uh, really an optimal kind of output right from, that, from the onset. So we're just going to do a E. coli K12 uh, de novo assembly in a Seekman Pro format, and we can pick our read technology. So there's a pull down here, and of course different read technologies have uh, you know, different quality scores, different lengths, different error models, and so as we pick our read technology, in this case I'll pick Illumina um, longer than 50 bases, and I added some paired data here, and you can see that um, I was prompted and entered in an insert size of 5,000 base pairs. And so I can load both unpaired and paired data. I can combine them, or I could have paired data with different insert sizes. In some cases, we have, if we're very lucky and have spent you know, a lot of money, uh, we've got multiple different pair libraries that we have, and, and those can be used to advantage in the software to get a some slightly more accurate um, scaffolding. So I've, I've just loaded uh, two paired Illumina files in FASTQ format. I can maybe expand this a bit. Um, and this is some next Terra data that's got uh, 5 KB inserts. Um, now I can set some of the kind of the parameters for the assembly. Now these are just the default parameters. We automatically do a quality trim, and that's very important for de novo assembly. Uh, with de novo assembly, um, having contaminating sequences or vectors, primers, adapters present um, can really impair de novo assembly. And in some cases, if you're having difficulty with de novo, what I recommend is to run a small, limit the input reads to, say, 100,000 reads, get something that finishes in just a few minutes, and then look and see, is there some contaminant you know, in the data? And oftentimes, you can identify a contaminant, and then you can set it up to scan for it, and that will give you a much more efficient assembly. Um, but if you have clean data, you just go with the, the full data set here, just use a quality trim. Um, there are a whole set of advanced options that I'm not going to describe in detail here, but you can see for challenging projects, de novo transcriptome is often a challenging project where we have to do a lot of different kinds of trimming. 
Um, but there are advanced options and full controls. And anywhere in the Seekman Engine Wizard, there's a contextual help menu. And the contextual help then defines what's in that window. And so if you do have a question about a parameter, what that parameter does, if you click the help, you can see you know, definitions for all the different um, parameters. So that's just something to keep in mind. And with the Novo assembly, there's actually probably more parameters than some of the other workflows. So um, we want repeat handling on. We enter a genome length for de novo genome. And make sure that that is, oh, that's one too many zeros. So 4.6 megabases. Um, we can set the single most important parameter in most assemblies is the minimum match percentage. With Illumina data, that is set at a default that's fairly stringent at 93%. And what that means is that um, as those contigs are forming in memory, uh, the, the sequences that are added must match the consensus 93%. So it allows for seven mismatches per 100 base pairs. And that's a pretty uh, um, optimal, for most Illumina sets, that's a pretty optimal uh, setting. However, you may find that for your data set, um, increasing this to 95 or even 97% produces maybe slightly smaller contigs, but maybe slightly more accurate. So increasing that match percentage increases the stringency in a de novo assembly. Likewise, decreasing to 85, maybe as low as 80, that's about as low as I would recommend going. Um, in some de novo assemblies, you may want to cluster things together more, right? So, so again, minimum match percentage, if you're going to change one parameter, that's the one to change. Not these other advanced gap penalties, and there's, you know, there's many other advanced options here. Before you start changing these parameters, you know, really try some minimum match percentages to see what it does with your, with your assembly. We can also remove some small contigs. Um, some, some data sets produce lots of tiny contigs, and we can call those out very easily. I commonly will use a minimum length of 250 and minimum of 100 sequences. And then we're ready to go. And we can click Next, and it's ready to assemble. And you can see what, what we have on the screen right now is um, really the script. So this wizard then is really writing this text script of instructions for the assembler. And the script is saved out automatically when we run our assemblies. Uh, the script is a great tool to send to DNA Star if you've got technical questions or need assistance. We can look at the script that was generated and understand what you're trying to do with the assembly and where any potential problems are. And when we click Assemble, a log will stream through. And we can also save that log file out. And when it's done assembling, we can launch the project and automatically open it in Seekman Pro. So that's so again, the wizard is just a series of click-through steps. Um, and we're sure hoping that it's the uh, easiest, uh, easy for you to make the right decision. It's clear to everybody, and we tweak this when we get feedback that if something's confusing, we keep tweaking this to make it as clear as possible. Um, and when it's done, then we get. an assembly file, and this is a .sqd file, and I've now opened it in Seekman Pro. So Seekman Pro then is the, the tool that we have that does all sorts of things. When we're working with a .sqd file, that's a fully editable file. So that is the proper format for working with genomes, making edits, um, making micro edits, macro edits, looking at the assembled data. And so what I have here is you can see scaffold. So this project um, has already been scaffolded. And we have a list of contigs then for that are within, within this project. And you can see we have some unlocated contigs or unscaffolded. Well, not in this project. They're all, they're all in this one scaffold. And if I scroll or sort by length, I can see some of the contigs that assembled are big. You know, we've got some contigs over 400,000 base pairs. And I can scroll through, double click on a contig. And this is what makes Seekman really nice to work with, is I can look at this assembled data. So you can see the reads, and here's the consensus at the top. I can export contig consensi sequences out right from all the contigs or one of the contigs. I can make edits. I can look at quality scores. So there are the quality scores for each one of the reads. Uh, these black triangles are trim points. 
so I can see what was trimmed off the sequence, and I can extend it. All right. So sometimes there's primers or linkers or adapters that had gotten trimmed off. Sometimes it's a trim by quality scores. It was just low quality. So here we can see not too much is trimmed off those particular reads. So again, it's a great tool for... And now I can make edits here as well. So I could select a region. There's a bunch of different ways to make edits. And I can delete. I can also put a cursor in a region, add a base. Right, so these are micro edits then that I can make. I can also make macro edits. So I might decide, you know, when I, as I'm doing editing, that I want to split a contig. So I might decide, well, I don't that there might be an error here in a contig. I can select a region and then go to the contig menu and split at insertion. I won't do that because this isn't a scaffold right now. But so I can split contigs together. I can also align contigs together and use algorithms in the program. And I, I don't have time to go through all the steps the editing steps. There are some webinars that focus just on the editing tools in Seekman. So it's a, you can see it's a whole palette of, of tools. So Seekman gives us this great interface then for working with contigs, um, viewing them, editing them. And then I can also run project commands like order contigs. Order contigs means read the mate pair data and put the contigs into a scaffold. So that's actually been done to this project. And I can see that in the project report here. And the project report lists all of, um, keeps track of everything that's happened to this project. So I can see how long it took, you know, eight minutes. There's 63 contigs that we started with. The contig at 50 is 150 KB. Average coverage is 27. And so I get all the kind of the metrics, of pair information metrics. All right, so the project report is great. Here's the script that was that the assembler used. And I'm just scrolling down, and here's where I see where order contigs was used. And this is the algorithm that reads the mate pair data. And it goes through, and it flips contigs around, reverse complements them, gets them into the scaffold. And you can see all the complementing. And then I did another thing. We align contigs end to end. Now that they're in a scaffold, there could be some match between adjacent contigs. Um, they weren't put together originally because it may be a repetitive element. So we have an algorithm that aligns it's called uh, align contigs end to end. And it looks in the scaffold and merges. So it's doing auto gap closure. And you can just see by the number of times it says merging that you know, we merged a good number of the contigs automatically. So again, those are some automated tools in our software. And the end result is kind of a project like this. And we have um, this project where I'll go to the project st statistics. And this just has a list, so we're down to 51 contigs. They are all they are all placed in one scaffold. The scaffold length is just about 4.6 megabases, so it's just a little under the full genome. Um, and now the contig N50 is 176k, so the, the data collapses then into one contig very neatly. And I'm just showing a strategy view now. Contig 6022, and we can see uh, there's a coverage and a pair consistency, and we can see these blue little arrows down here. And those are the mate pairs um, in our strategy view that were used to order contigs 60 next to 22. And so again, that's, that's our scaffolding tool. Okay, so that is um, the Novo General Assembly, and I, I know I threw an awful lot at you quickly, and we're going to just move on kind of the, to the next workflow, and that's going to be metagenomics. And I'll just jump back here briefly. So metagenomic workflow. Um, so if you have projects where you have, um, it could be 16S um, RNA, or it could be viral sequences or bacterial sequences, just a, a complex mix. And oftentimes a goal is to, if you have a complex mixture, is to identify what's in that mixture. And there's different challenges to aligning metagenomic data. Um, in some cases, you've got a nice database. If you have bacterial sequences or viral, and you expect that the species there are going to be in the database, um, you can just align the data to the database and, that, and, and look at where the reads align to determine what the makeup is, of, is, is in the sample. Uh, there could be some uh, challenges, though. You may have host uh, genomic DNA present. And so with our software, we've built in tools that allow you to remove the host sequences automatically. So it aligns first to the host sequences, collects everything that doesn't align, 
and then it either de novo assembles or aligns to a, a reference set or data of database sequences. And so there's multiple different kind of variations to a metagenomic assembly. Um, our assembler is, is a very powerful tool, and it allows you to, to align sequences, in some cases, to over a million reference sequences. If you're doing 16S from RDP, um, you can have one and a half million reference sequences that you're sorting the data to. So we'll, we'll take a look at the, the interface then. And so if I select metagenomics, um, I have different options here. It can be de novo, it can be templated assembly with uh, host removal, or it could be a de novo assembly with host removal. So if I pick one of host removal, I pick an output folder, and I can input the host files. Uh, if it's human or one of the model organisms, I can just add one of the genome template packages that um, DNA Star provides. And there's a link here. If you haven't been to this page at all, um, there's a link to genome template packages. And these can be downloaded. And you can see for a number of the main model organisms, a template package is all the chromosome sequences plus the dbSNP database. And for human, there's some cancer databases and um, GERP databases. So this is a great resource for getting access and downloading these genomes. So we can load the, the host files in. And then I'll just remove what we did before. And we can add our sequence data. And so this is going to be unpaired data. So I'm going to the metagenome workflow. And here's some FASTQ files. So there's the input. And again, I have some trim options. and some output options. So I'm just going to keep it default, and it's ready to go. And so that would give us a de novo assembly um, with host removal. Now, if I have a reference set of um, bacterial genomes, you know, then I can pick templated assembly with host removal. So that means pull out the host, but let's align to a database. change the project name. Now you can see the interface changes a little bit. It says, um, where do you want the temporary files process? So this, again, back to the hardware. When I'm doing this alignment, um, if I'm aligning to a million uh, reference sequences, um, that's going to take a lot of processing on, on a disk. And so I'll make sure that I have a scratch disk set up. In this case, I have this F drive that has, we have to wake the F drive up, though. So I have to click Next there. So here's my host files again. And now we're going to input the biome genomes. And this is the point where we pick our list of sequences to align against. And so I can add them or add a folder of them. I think in this case I want to add a, a folder. And this, it's going to be a microbial genome database. So we're just going to load that folder. And we'll go back and I'll show you what's in that folder as well. And here's our input data. and it's going to align to that biome to that at very high stringency, 99% match percentage. And there's some very stringent advanced options as well. So we want to make sure that we place reads to the best template when we've got 5,000 genomes that we're aligning to. We want to keep that as stringent as possible. And we let that run. And we'll get an output file that looks like this. Again, we get our project report. Um, this project report now is, a, is essentially it's the alignment to these genomes. So we get um, kind of all the metrics from the assembly, the script, the parameters. And now we get this, this list. And the list then is um, these, these names of contigs now are the reference sequences where our data aligned. And you can see some names, uh, some bacterial names. Um, and bacterioides, which is common in gut. So this is a, um, a, a metagenomic sample from gut. And we can see the length, you know, it's five megabases, and we've got about 10,000 reads aligning. So we get an idea of what's in that sample just based on the number of reads aligning. And we can see there's some um, 
human contaminant that still made it through our screen. So we still are picking up a little bit of that, but it's mostly different bacterial species. The database that we aligned to um, was downloaded from NCBI, and we did modify it just a little bit. I just want to show you, so in our metagenomic, so depending on where the database comes from, uh, we use a FASTA file uh, reference sequence. And so, and this one was alphabetically uh, organized here, and you can see here's the A species. We're just going to look inside this with the Universal Viewer. So when we use FASTA files, the convention of FASTA files is that the sequence name has this uh, greater than symbol and followed by the name of the sequence. And so we edited this to put the species name here, right? And so that's what shows up in our software. Oftentimes, database sequences will have a database ID number there, and then there might be some delimiters with the species name. And so just keep that in mind with this workflow. Um, if the species name isn't showing up in your analysis, um, that's something we can help you with to get the species name to appear as, as you want it in your analysis. So that's one of the, one of the main challenges. So again, we get our assembly. Um, we get some nice outputs. Now, of course, we can go in and, and look here. Um, you know, so I might do a strategy view like this. And what I'm looking for here is, now there's not a lot of data on this. It's, it's just you can see this depth of coverage. It's you know, uh, below 10 by and large. But I see that the, the coverage is more or less evenly distributed across the genome. So that tells me I'm pretty confident that, um, that bacterioides is in this sample. Um, if I have all the data just aligned in one little narrow area, one just spike of data, that could just be a conserved element. And not really that species, but just a conserved element that that species has. So when we do these metagenomic kind of sort, sorts, it's very important to you know, kind of go in and confirm some of the, you know, so I might go and look at a few of these. And it looks like that one's pretty evenly distributed, right? Now, we can't do that for thousands of templates. I'm just kind of showing you um, where it's really nice to be able to go and look at a couple. So we have some other reporting, and one of them is a results, a tab delimited results file uh, that we'll take a look at here. So, so this is another one of the outputs, and I just opened it in Excel for you. And you can see the same bacterioides here, so it's the same result in 10,000 sequences. But it gives us a little bit more uh, information. We get a seek count, we get a SNP count, and then we also get percent template coverage. And so one of the one of the most common questions we'll get with metagenomics is, well, how do I determine what is in my sample? And it's really a combination of sequence count and template coverage. If you've got a large number of sequences aligning and a larger percent of the template covered, that organism is likely in your sample. Whereas I could have a high sequence count, but very low template coverage. That might just be, again, that spike of data over some conserved element. And so with metagenomic alignment, um, again, I might, uh, depending on where I go from here, I might export content consensus sequences, do phylogenetic alignments in Megaline Pro. Um, there's some other things that we can, we can do with this, with this workflow. So it's, it's a great tool. This alignment to this whole bacterial database um, it can be done just in a, in a few hours, as long as you have enough disk space. Um, so it's a really powerful algorithm and, and gives you a nice output to work with. Okay, so that's our metagenomic workflow. So we're going to bounce back to our uh, next workflow here. And this is the gene panel workflow. And the gene panel workflow is um, one of the, the new workflows in version 12, and it's really, there's three sub-workflows, the Mendelian, the Cancer, and the Validation workflow. And depending on which workflow we pick, there's going to be slightly different SNP calling parameters. And the Validation workflow is really used, again, as I mentioned earlier, um, to validate your process. If you've got a control genome with a, with a, with a set of SNPs that you know are in a sample, um, you can run our validation workflow and actually determine how effectively all your targets were hit and what the percent and accuracy is for the SNP calls. So, so we call it three different workflows. And the software really is, is designed um, to accommodate um, different size samples as well. And so we may have gene panels with just one or two. It could be a normal or in, in tumor, and that's one of the examples we'll look at today. Uh, but you can also scale up the analysis in our software. So we can do association studies. So for example, if you have 100 human exomes from diseased individuals and controls, 
um, our software can analyze, you know, 100 exomes and find, you know, potential um, disease uh, uh, causing variants in, you know, particular gene set. So, so it's very scalable um, and can accommodate, you know, very, very large data sets. So really the challenge becomes, you know, if each individual has four million background variations that are unique to an individual, is how do we how do we filter through all of that and find just that handful of variations or even one variation that may be causing disease uh, in in an individual, and so that really requires a couple of things: really you know good data and really good accurate assembly, and then a way to narrow down the search to filter or to narrow down the gene list to you know find those um, um, genes that that are causing the problem. And so one of the ways to do this is to use the gene panels. And gene panels are, are offered by Ion Torrent and Illumina. And what they are is a, you know, a list of hotspot candidate genes that are known to cause certain diseases. Um, you may also have custom panels that you've designed on your own. If you're doing your own custom design, our software offers some really nice tools for assessing the targeting, you know, doing an enrichment to see you know, how many of your targets you actually hit. You know, so you can use our software to quality control um, the, the, the panel design as well as the SNP calling. Uh, these kind of workflows have, uh, so typically you'll have FASTQ or BAM input files, um, and then two file types, bed files and VCF. Um, those are files that are very important for gene panels, and, I'll, and, and they warrant a little bit, a few extra comments here about what they are. Um, bed files, they can also be called manifest files for Illumina customers are really just tab-limited text files that define the targeted regions in, in the genome. And so, uh, you know, there might be 10 genes, there could be 1,000 genes, and oftentimes it's the exons that are targeted, so each exon in those genes may be targeted. So the bed file is just a list of those targeted areas. And uh, our software uses them in a, in, in a very important way, and that's um, you can use the bed file then as a filter to separate variant calls that fall outside of the intended areas. So if in these panels, it's common to have sequences align outside those areas. Um, customers that um, have custom panels might not have a bed file. You just may have a list of genes or exon targets in an Excel sheet. Um, it is possible to, to create um, a bed file out of an Excel sheet. So, so that's something that, that we can certainly help you with. Um, VCF files are also... Um, just a text file, and they contain really just a list of SNPs that are interesting, their chromosome number and their position. And so our software will use SNP files up front to, um, to identify which reference locations contain these SNPs, um, and then we can use them to filter against, um, to figure out which samples have these SNPs of interest. A VCF file can also contain annotation information, database linkages, to outside databases, we can import those into a Raystar to annotate or decorate a SNP table with additional tertiary type information. So the tools that we have in DNA Star um, can then be used, you know, using these bed files and VCF files. And if you have a control data set, we can actually determine gene panel accuracy. And one one of these data sets, um, and, and again, these are described on our website in more detail is the genome in a bottle data set um, uh, from NIST. And I'll talk about that just in a little bit here. And, and the author to this is Justin Zook. And what this reference data set is, is human genome NA12878. That's been sequenced by a variety of sequencing platforms. And through all the different platforms and different SNP callers, um, NIST was able to determine where the high quality SNPs are that have been validated, so they're very certain to, I don't know what percent, but it's 99.99 something, um, but it's able to determine where the SNPs are in the human genome. And so in this little diagram here, we have human chromosome one and some little pink uh, diamonds that indicate SNPs. And NIST um, has regions in the human genome that can be called the high confidence, and that's these red lines. It's not all the human genome, but it's most of it. And so these are high confidence areas where SNPs are known to occur in this individual. And what we can do with our software is um, create an intersection so that if you have a gene panel of 
a number of genes, you can intersect it then when, with the NIST data set and sequence using that panel sequence this control individual. And that gives you a really nice control for a gene panel then to see, you know, do I detect all the SNPs with my panel that are in these intersected areas? And you can use that intersection then to determine the accuracy of, you know, of your capture, you know, for your gene panel. Did you capture everything? Did you sequence everything deeply? Is the assembler assembling everything accurately? And is the SNP caller calling everything accurately? So again, it's a, a great tool. We have, a, again, additional webinars and information just on this workflow. Um, but this is a great, if you're not thinking about doing validation of your panels, um, you should really uh, strongly consider having a control like this for, for your process. So at this point, we'll jump back into the software. Oh, I just want to show you so, so an example of a report here. So once you have that control, our software will generate this accuracy report. It will determine the true positives and false positives, and from that information um, can calculate an accuracy. So you get this kind of a report then on your data set um, that reflects, gives you the accuracy then. So we'll jump out here and go back to Seekman engine. So we'll go back through the wizard, and in this case we can pick a gene panel workflow. And so with the gene panel workflow, we may have um, uh, a control, or some, sometimes we have a control, sometimes not a control, but we can set it up with a control here. And here's our template file. And you can see down here a targeted regions file. So with the gene panel, we are going to provide a, let's go back to my desktop, a bed file. So here's a bed file. And we can add our new data. Now this is going to be ion torrent data. And so we can see we have some tumor. And I'm just going to, I can name it now. And normal. And you can see with when I select a control, this is a multiple sample project, and it's going to run these as separate projects now. So we'll get two different BAM output files, and then we can do the analysis. We can look at them in Seekman. We can also import them into a Raystar. And I can define what the control is. So the normal, and this is a baseline kind of a control. And I can define and say, well, there's a, a VCF file here as well. So there's some known variations in this control. So now I'm going to load up a VCF file. And assembly options again. Um, this is going to be heterogeneous. We're looking for some rare SNPs, maybe looking for rare SNPs. And I can click Next and Assemble. When I'm done, I'll have the option to load this in Arraystar or in Seekman. I'll have two different assemblies. I can look at an assembly in Seekman Pro, and so now I have human chromosomes. These contigs represent human chromosome sequences. All right, you can see human chromosome 1 here. If I highlight unscaffolded contigs and run a SNP report, I get a SNP report for the whole project. And so now I have a SNP report for this project. You can see there's 163 SNPs in this. Uh, this is the tumor sample, and this is interactive now with the alignment view. I can double click and go right to that point in the alignment. And I can see this twisty triangle. This is chromosome 5. I see the annotations. Here's the aligned data. I can see the SNP base highlighted in blue. So it's a really nice interactive report. All right. And again, we have webinars that we spend much more time in just the SNP calling here. But there's, there's filters here that I can apply, a whole set of filters. Um, I can also look at SNPs that were um, listed as reference SNPs in my VCF file or dbSNP that aren't reported as SNPs. So I might want to look at those and say, well, why, why were some reference SNPs missed? And here I sorted and I said, well, here's one at 100%. Why was that? And I look at it and I'm like, oh, there's only one sequence that aligned there. So that, that was not counted, did not meet our minimum criteria. So I can look at SNPs that, you know, that, that aren't present there or just show all of them. I can also run a coverage report. 
and this shows me the coverage of the targeted areas in the bed file. So this is a really, again, if you're designing your own panel or if you want to check, hey, did the panel that I just got from my sequence provider, uh, did it hit all my targets? And so I can sort this report by percent coverage. So what this is is a list of all the genes, the features, and the locations. And I can see that we're 100% covered here. And I can scroll through. It's a big table. And I have it sorted by percent coverage. And there's actually some where a few that are missed, 52% covered. Well, what happened there? So I can double-click on that report. And there's the highlighted area. Well, I have sequence data, but I missed. There's no coverage in some of it. So it's a great tool to go and evaluate how well um, the actual targeting. And the enrichment report is a summary of the targeting. And if we get 100% of the targets, the base enrichment is 100%. Here it's 82.76%. Mean coverage of 139. So it's a nice report that way. Um, so I can run uh, get SNPs, um, filter for SNPs. The different columns contain all different information. I'm just going to scroll so you can see what's here. We have SNP percent, the capture region, is it there or not, a DB SNP ID that we can go and look up that SNP by the RS number directly to DB SNP. So I can do that directly from the SNP report. Um, there's a GURP score, which is an evolutionary rate profile. The user ID, so that's the um, that's the, if it has a user ID, that means it's in my VCF file. It's a custom SNP, feature name and feature type. And then there's things like protein change and DNA change that I can um, bring into the columns as well. So lots of information. The SeqMan SNP report is really excellent for um, looking at the assembled data and interacting then with, you know, so here's the DNA change, protein change. Again, I can double click anywhere here and go and look at that assembled data. So it's a excellent interface. Now, if I want to compare groups of SNPs, tumor versus normal, SeqMan isn't the best interface for that. When I, if I have 100 exomes or multiple gene panels, I can import them into another piece of software, and that's ArrayStar. And ArrayStar then allows us to file, import um, you know, SNP projects. And so I can add the dot assembly BAM output from SeqMan Engine. I can keep loading more projects into a ray star. And here we just have the two, the, the, the control and the tumor. And we get a SNP table. And the SNP table really becomes a summary now. It's a little different from the SeqMan SNP table. It gives me a reference position, reference ID, gene name. And then I get the SNP call for each sample. In this case, it's just two samples. But I could have, again, 100 samples here. And a ray star then allows me to do my own set of filtering, a different set. And so I can filter my different groups and save those filters. So we have a whole set of filters, and we can create SNP sets that we can compare against each other. So for example, I could, I could choose, uh, just show me all the non-synonymous SNPs in you know, the control group and search. And I get 160, there's our 164 SNPs. And I can save that as a set. And I can do the same thing for the tumor. And so I end up with a list then of sets, control, and tumor. All right, and then I can do things like a Venn diagram. And from the Venn diagram, I can look at groups like group B, which is specific just to um, the tumor group. And there's some links in the bottom right corner. Our window is here flickering with the WebEx going, though, so I don't think I can get it. But I can get a, generate then a list of genes from uh, those SNPs. So in this case, we have the list of genes that uh, where there were SNPs in the tumor group. And ArrayStar allows us to import annotation columns. So I can bring in annotations from DB and FSP or import them directly um, into ArrayStar. So again, that's kind of a crash course in um, advanced SNP analysis in ArrayStar. And so here's uh, some of the database linkages that we have with human. You can see we downloaded the human set and that populates the gene table. I can also do a file, import, annota import annotations, and bring in dbnsfp, which is just a, a list of additional annotations from another database. And I can use those then to populate um, the gene table. OK. Well, we have, we're 
getting short on time, I'm just going to show one last bit here, and that's uh, some of the RNA seq. And with RNA seq, and there's a number of different things we can do, and that is uh, differential gene expression and isoform analysis. Uh, we can also do SNP analysis with RNA seq data sets. And if you have microarray data, it is possible to compare RNA seq back to microarray. And we can do this primarily in a ray star. Uh, the workflow is similar to how we set up, say, a gene panel. We set up, uh, uh, we align um, our sequence data to a reference genome. We can look at the assembly in SeqMan, and we can do the gene expression and compare the different sets in a ray star. And this particular data set is uh, with a, um, let's see here, is with uh, three different cow species. And so it's uh, possible to look for differential gene expression. And oops, I just got a, a pause in the webinar here. Uh, there we go, we're back. I can show this last slide. So we have three, three different uh, cow species, and we can compare them. So I'm just going to go back to uh, the, we'll go back to Eng, and I'll just go back to SeqMan here. And so we do the assembly of the RNA-seq data, and now we have the three samples together in one project, the Cholostani, Holstein, and Jersey. And I'm just showing kind of a collapsed view where we can see, oh, it looks like there's variation in two of them. And again, I can look at the two samples and look at SNP variations. And I can still do SNP reporting if I want between the three different breeds. Um, but if I want to do uh, differential gene expression, I can import into a RayStar. Instead of a SNP project, it's, it is a, um, uh, an RNA-seq project. And so a RayStar then will count the reads, use RPKM normalization. We again have, a, like the SNP analysis, we have an experiment list. And now we have a, things like scatter plots, so I can compare gene expression between two different breeds. Um, I have all different filtering options. So, so here I have some um, genes selected because I applied some filters. Right? And so the filtering can get uh, quite elaborate. So in this case, I'm filtering the Chalistani and Holstein group by expression levels. I wanted a, a, a minimum baseline expression and then I also said, show me fold changes between the two groups of fourfold in either experiment. And that gives me a list of 650 genes then. And again, I can filter on all different, on, on gene annotation, on gene classification. So there's a number of different ways I can apply the filters and create the sets. And once I have a gene, so really the goal is uh, filter based on expression pattern and narrow down from thousands of genes to a handful of genes that may be interesting. And so then I can get something like the gene table. And the gene table, again, will have um, expression values. Um, I can also populate and bring in annotation information into this gene table. And so this is cow, so there's um, some Go IDs. It's a little bit more limited than human for annotations, but I can bring in you know, a number of different annotation fields then into the, into the project. Okay, well, I think we should wrap up here. Um, I'm going to um, turn this back over to Jackie, and I know she has some, oops, that's uh, a few finishing comments here, and I'll be glad to stick around the next uh, few minutes to answer any questions that came in during the webinar. So thanks again, and we'll talk to you again soon. Hi there, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot, Matt. I'm just going to pull up our DNA Star website here. Uh, it, since we're out of time today, we've got a couple questions left, um, so we'll follow up with you with a detailed response after the webinar today. Uh, feel free, as I'm wrapping up here, to chat in any other questions, and we'll make sure we get back to you. Uh, additionally, if you think of any other questions later, you can email those to me at webinars at dnastar.com, or you can tweet us at DNA Star Inc. Uh, also, feel free to email me with ideas for future webinar topics. Uh, thanks again for joining us today. We hope you found this webinar helpful. Uh, we do have a large collection of videos on the website, as I believe Matt uh, has mentioned, so that I'd encourage you to check out this video library yourself when you have some time. Additionally, we also offer fully functional free trials uh, of LaserGene 12, which you can download from our website uh, to try those workflows you saw today out for yourself. 
Uh, again, you can register for any upcoming webinars as well as watch recordings of any of our past webinars right here on our webinars page. Uh, our next scheduled webinar will be held on October 8th, and we'll go over some of the new cloud functionality that will be available soon in the upcoming LaserGene 12.1 release. Uh, thanks again for joining us today, and have a great day.